Welcome back here. Moving on with the operating officer for IoT AI Inc. Coming to us from Austin, Texas. Topic of his presentation is going to be Edge as a Service, Radio and Analytics for Internet and Battlefield of Things. The company will have 10 minutes to conduct their presentation. We'll ring a bell if you start going too far over, and then a 10 minute Q&A. So, JD, we'll let you take it away. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to turn my volume down just so it doesn't. Uh, thank you uh, for your time today, and thank you for allowing us to be part of this program. Uh, we're really excited uh, to be part of this. Uh, we love the mission, uh, but we also are very seasoned experts uh, who are trying to do the right thing for national security purposes, but also to help the general world and gen the general world around industrial oil and gas. Uh, a couple things. One is uh, I'm going to show you the little black box ahead of time. Uh, this is actually a two-pound box. It actually has an RF, LPI, LPD radio in it, low RF spectrum has analytics built into it, uh, uh, A2AD, uh, 10 cap is actually validated and actually tested this part, but also we uh, certified. Uh, and so when I say A2AD, the entire box is actually very heavily secured. The physical device itself, uh, the motherboard, the chip, the firmware, the software, and also the network is dual encrypted as it goes in and out. And it's a one watt uh, box uh, for both analytics and radio. Additionally, uh, we're in the process of actually shrinking it down uh, we've been working on the Air Force side, and so there's there's elements of that that we can highlight. And most importantly, for those in the mission side, um, we actually uh, natively support ATAC. I'll show a little bit of that, uh, but this is an ATAC exercise that I will highlight that we did with support only about a month and a half ago. Basically, the default comms because I'll sat comment down. Uh, so thank you very much for your time today as I show you those. But we'll go to this first slide, uh, please, and the next slide. First of all, who we are is uh, very seasoned people. Uh, Kevin, my co-founder, uh, he was a NASA scientist, uh, Stanford professor. He ran the telemedicine lab for Army uh, at, at Stanford. Uh, he also uh, has a Smithsonian Award around tele, uh, telemedicine and high compression. Uh, we've actually done uh, that one box linked to an Iridium satellite at one kilobit links for vital signs uh, with the Air Force. Uh, myself, I was almost 20 years at Cisco. A uh, very seasoned person. My patents at Cisco are AI, so we're no BS between the two of us. Ask us any question, we'll just tell you the real state of it. Uh, but we're also both very good commercial experts. Uh, we've been around the block for a while. Uh, and so we know how to take this stuff and try to do it not just for the defense side, where I actually worked in the public sector of Cisco as a CTO uh, across network centric warfare days. I lived through the debacle of uh, wind, tea, and jitters also, so I know the pain point on the radio end. And then Kevin himself has actually been developing sensor platforms for over 20 years uh, to do uh, high, extremely low RF, uh, extreme conditions, wettest places in the world, um, hard conditions, including uh, Balad, Iraq. And so that gives you some sense of who we are. We are radio experts, sensor experts, um, AI experts, and that's what we've taken our knowledge to do our solution. Next slide, please. Now you all have to laugh with me as I have the buzziest name in the world as a company, IoT AI. Everybody goes, JD, how'd you get that? And second, I even have the URL. I, don't ask me how I got it. We just got lucky, count our blessings, whatever that is. And so I got all the hype buzzwords, but as I mentioned, we are no BS and I have the black box. So uh, you just have to laugh with me. Um, the good thing about this though, I want you to understand a couple things. We see the black box as a, yes, it is a hardware device, which is kind of challenging in today's market. Most of the VCs say, oh, we want all software as a service, or even the radio market, we want software-defined radios. And as you all know, a lot of the, even the SDRs still have fundamental problems around hackability, intercept, jam, and so forth in contested and austere environments because of some of the physical elements. And so we've addressed that. But we've also got years of research into this to really look at how do we scale beyond the, the limitations today? How do we actually create a modular system that addresses multiple use cases? And at the last uh, phase two event, it was interesting. Uh, one of the judges afterwards came out and said they're debating on what you are. What are you? Are you a radio? Are you an IoT gateway? Are you a solution? And she thought we could be a telemaintenance solution for facilities. Another person came out and said, oh, you're directly available for the 2028 requirement of tactical radio. And that shows you our dilemma is that we do radio and analytics in a two pound box at one watt. Um, we do have a creative uh, at the Army Future uh, Command. Uh, General Gallagher has been briefed in the past about what we do. So we're working on that. But we're not just a black box. If you go to the next slide, please. And this is the key point that I ask your help. I need your help to win this, this phase so we can move on to the next phase because we want to cross the line. And what I mean by cross the line is that we have built a modular system 
of the edge extreme edge battery operated powered full integration capabilities we validated we can integrate with the army's battery system itself so take our motherboard out put it into a vest uh, but also if you look at that one uh, red circle that's that support so in a project called patriot grizzly which is an exercise you have to go onto the island red team blue team all satcom failed even including the most newest multi-million dollar satcoms could not get configured by the team they rolled us out they said the next 36 hours you are the main comms routine all red team blue team and that was the ATAC I showed you earlier. So we recorded the entire ATAC, and because we have a multi-domain uh, kind of back-end cloud, we exercises and training. And what I tell you is this, it's multi-kilometer, it's a secure radio, when all other comms were disconnected and allowed the exercise to continue, including a live event that occurred during that situation. And so it is a system. You guys under Jason, who I met at an Austin event not too long ago, uh, they want the to actually integrate into the avionics and maintenance side. And so you're seeing that some people use this for comms. Some people are looking at how do I take the data off of the MH60 and feed that to our AI in the back end. That's what the thing, because our AI is better than Honeywell and GE. And then also we do IoT gateways. So perimeter fences for security. Uh, we did SO2 monitoring in Iraq with our second generation of this product. So we have been on the nipper. And that's what you find here is that black box is really a modular system because it allows you to do different types of comms. Next slide, please. And as part of that, we're solving multiple technical problems. Um, we've actually worked on PNT, so this has GPS denied location tracking built into it. We've worked on over 4,000 different sensor types to integrate. We've worked on cloud dependencies, non-cloud dependencies. We recently just won an STTR to do distributed AI at the edge. So that just came to us a few weeks ago. We just signed a contract. And now we're in the process of doing that phase one with Southwest Research uh, Institute. And so this is what we're about, is solving the warfighter problems around experience. Next slide, please. And as you know, the, the warfighters are frustrated. Uh, ATAC is only connected anywhere from 30 to 50%. I'm lucky being in Austin, Texas, I hear Murray and I hear uh, first class privates. Everyone says, yeah, it doesn't really work. All this hype about AR, VR at the edge, it doesn't work in the tactical cursor on target environment. And we're really good at that level. Um, and so we've taken a lot of the independent silo technologies, integrated into a secure kind of system to move that forward. Next slide, please. As part of that, we look at the readiness for the, for the Army, the Air Force defense. We look at resiliency in, in austere and condensed environments. We're looking at execution. Uh, we got, uh, I'll count my blessings again, just uh, this past weekend, uh, one of the soldiers support took all by themselves. We weren't involved in the demonstration at all. He booted it up, he showed ATAC, he had a couple of his team members working together. It was great for us to see that it was working in a live environment without us there and the soldiers could do it. And that's a lot about how do we help the soldiers in the army to, with a better experience? Because today, you know, wind, tea, land, water, they just don't work very well. Next slide, please. Now talk about dual use. Uh, how do you de-risk this for the army? Uh, one is that we have a Cyber 2 today for the Air Force that's actually enabling ultra secure comms on the flight line. So that flight line of the future, which actually applies very well to guys, where we can go into RF restricted environments. Uh, even if we don't do, do RF, we have unique ways to be able to actually still have some kind of connectivity in those ultra secure bomb dumps. And so we are securing that in our current Cyber 2. We have the potential of another direct to Cyber 2 to, to miniaturize it down to basically. Uh, that is not funded yet, but they're in the process of talking to us. So that will be fully integrated, wearable on their chest or someplace on the body. Uh, additionally, we won the AFWorks uh, microelectronics challenge. So a TRL level four, where AFWorks is paying us to take that black box I showed you, take the motherboard and shrink it down to a chip. They all have radio and AI, uh, all the same capabilities you have today, but all with inside of the, uh, a chip uh, that allows you to embed that into UAVs. And that first project is a six inch UA UAV for subterranean and also for urban comp, but also into other environments. It could be embedded onto a vest, it could be embedded onto other UAVs, it could be embedded, and that's why when we talk about internet battlefield of things, we really believe that we have the leading technology both in the commercial world, but also in the defense world to really help on the national security interest side. And so the market sizes are large. Um, if we pull off both, we also have seen that the IoT gateway is very usable for multiple use cases, aggregations, biochem, those types of things. And then the embedded chip will also be a secondary kind of a parallel market that we can target. Next slide, please. 
our demonstration we plan for the next event is basically a demo how we could uh, take a few of these devices and network them together, um, add some sensors like noise sensors or some uh, low end video sensors. Uh, we could then and add ATAC like I showed you earlier so we can show a live TAC feed, uh, mission packs, uh, chat, those types of things without any northbound comms. And then also add uh, our stretch goals, add an autonomous vehicle to that to show you how we could, could do that. And once again, all those anti-AI uh, environments that actually deny um, UAVs, we're actually uh, really good at, at preventing some of that because uh, Army locked on, intercept, or deny. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a good summary slide. You have it, uh, but I'd like to move to the next slide to make sure we have time for questions before the bell ring. And this is what I need. I need you to help us cross the line. We believe we have what the warfighter needs. We need to be able to, to engage with the Army, to find the mission folks like we have on the Air Force side who can really tell us what's going on, where they're really frustrated, they need connectivity, they want something that's wearable today, but they're also looking for the next generation that we're working towards. Uh, and that's kind of where we are. We're a small startup with 12 people. Uh, we've been working on this for well over 15 years though. This is our third gen capability. It was a couple of years ago, my co-founder, Kevin, asked me, JD, just come out of Cisco. Stop pounding your head against the big corporate world. I need your help because I think I'm ready to take this into a new new startup and really kind of move this forward. And so last year was really good. We won the AFWERX Mark Challenge. We won at Cyber 2. Um, we won the STTR with the ARL lab right now. It's a very small one, but at least now it's our first Army contract just a few weeks ago. And we need more of those. And so your help is what we really need is the contacts inside the Army, um, helping us find the real mission users, the experienced people, and really helping to take this device into IoT and analytics situations, but then the smaller device into the wearable vest, UAVs, the unmanned ground vehicles, those types right, of things. So cool. thank you very thank much you. for your Thanks time today cool. and for actually supporting the virtual session. Great. Um, so we'll move quickly into questions here in, in the last kind of eight or nine minutes here. I wonder if you could hone in really quickly on kind of this is these device, right? It does a lot of different things. You mentioned it's got the buzzword. What's really the IP built around? What's the competitive right to win in kind of a device that can do a lot of things? Uh, so uh, our IP is years of work, and so it's all prior arted. Um, because of the cyber uh, prevention A2AD stuff, we do not patent that uh, very specifically. Uh, but we have uh, worked with TS Plus environments. And so uh, we have uh, years of work in it, years of experience at working at the extreme edge most, uh, and I can speak because I come from Cisco, most technologies, they come from an enterprise view down, trying to port enterprise knowledge and protocols down. Um, that device I showed you held up to 1,500 nodes and as actually uh, four weeks ago, actually two weeks ago, 1,000 nodes. We have a simulated system that's doing that. And so well beyond existing tactical ranges today that max out at 150 to 300 in contested environments, let alone austere environments. And so the IP is built on the layers of technology, which include the radio, the sensors, and then the AI parts. But most importantly, we're built modular to support any C5 uh, IR system or any enterprise system. So Emerson on the commercial side is one of our customers. And so we operate with inside of their thermoelectric power plants and link in their own vibration sensors to help them collect more data for their own AI. What's um what what's the maybe some some stats on some of the boxes? What's the data rate that's that's available on the boxes you have right have right now? Uh, so uh, right now in that current mesh, um, within multiple kilometers, uh, we're running about one megabit per second. Uh, but you as as you know, it depends on on variable. But we've been able to reach up, um, but that's at bods. Uh, but we're well beyond what the existing tactical radios do in forest. So in in thick vegetation, we've got miles. Uh, at GIFX, and we have test results for this, on a 150-foot tunnel at GIFX, 45-degree bend, we only had three radios, no repeater. And also, JVAB tested us in the facility in San Antonio, uh, 120,000 square feet, uh, two flights of stairs down, uh, cement and metal, and we went radio to radio. So we have AI actually in the mesh network that allows us to see RF um, variances and RF spectrum issues that allows us to adapt the radio. Uh, they didn't think that was valid because the requirement required us to have mesh on. And so we actually showed them that our radios are intelligent enough to go radio to radio without actually going through the mesh. But we had to demonstrate that the mesh was on. But that gives you at least a sense of, of, of bandwidth. We're not built for the high-end uh, video 4K, 
But I think every soldier knows is when you're an austere contestant environments, 4K, even 10 to get, let alone AR, VR components. Got it, got it. One, one question here around, um, so you mentioned again, your IP is kind of built in layers on all the way from the, the kind of hardware sensors and radio all the way up through the meshing network. Is there an ability to tie into existing networks or is this something you'd really need to start from scratch and feel you know, a million copies of your solution to create a new network? No, so we built it to be legacy supportive um, and as, as my past days at Cisco, no forklift upgrades. So these are built actually to be modular. So the motherboard is, itself supports multiple radios. So when we, for example, could you support a software defined radio? We said, sure, if you have one, tell us, we'll put it on there. Um, so that would mesh with our current radio, which keeps the resiliency low RF, LPI, LPD, but then we'd route back northbound. Um, additionally, on that one exercise, all SATCOM was down. Uh, we actually just plugged into a, a radium link and bounced up to get the mission packs for ATAC. Um, additionally, one of the unique we've done to scale the, the interoperability is that we treat every other radio actually as a, um, as a sensor. So we're able to actually integrate with other systems um, on the battlefield uh, and other radio environments because we'll just packetize it uh, just like and we have ether. So we can even route locally, even when northbound comms actually go down. Got it. But it's fully integrated. Uh, we actually support third-party analytics on our devices. They actually want to put their AI at the edge, flying in, but they're not going to do that yet. But that's one of the future use cases they're asking about. Uh, and so we can support third-party analytics there. You could support third-party cybersecurity, but we've seen most of those have more vulnerabilities than we do. Um, we've been mil-spec certified by uh, AFRL, uh, but that's the, that's the whole A2AD that goes everything from physical level to the software level. So how do you PNT? So today we do that through a couple different techniques. Um, we do not have the atomic clock, so to say, or the uh, motion. We could put those on, but as everybody knows, those require a lot more wattage and a lot more power. Um, so we actually do it through the radiation because of some of the AI and machine learning. It's just math. We actually know where our devices are. Uh, we know a lot about GPS denied conditions because they wanted us to act without any compromise. So they showed us all the techniques that we could work around it. That was a couple of years ago. So we've worked that into the code. And so we do it based on uh, where our own clock, which is uh, basically working between all the devices. Uh, we work on a GPS uplink, downlink when available. Uh, we also have geofencing and then some is um, uh, it's basically, it's the triangulation of the radio signal itself because we know the strength of the power of the device. We know the, the strength of the signal. We know the strength of the mesh, but we also know because we can do a direct, direct radio, we can actually have, oh, I can see that person, but I can't connect to them. So at the mesh, so there's a little bit, there's about four or five different techniques. If someone's interested, I can give them information about how we do our shared PNT. Uh, we did penetrate through um, uh, the GIFX and showed location services in the deny tunnel um, of those uh, within a half meter to up to a meter. Got it, cool. Um, the anti-jamming capabilities, but what happens if one, one of the nodes is spoofed, for instance, by a bad actor? Are they able to gain access immediately onto you know, some of the farthest off nodes, or is there kind of a, um, a firewall in place against spoofing or jamming? Yeah, so uh, happy to answer that in more detail later, but today no one's been able to, to, to penetrate, uh, and that includes the 10CAP and Slab Lab folks. And so what you find, there's multiple levels of techniques that are built in well beyond TS plus level. So the radio itself is at 156. Additionally, uh, any physical device, including your ATAC, if it's plugged into us, we actually have a bit in actual wire itself so there's a uh, we also monitor through a drifting algorithm every sensor packet that comes through us so even if they tried to spoof the actual end sensor there's a what's called a drifting algorithm that looks at the packet by packet bit by bit um, in order to do that if anything ever was compromised device then shuts off to be able to at least identify that is, but the network itself self self heals. I mean, it's, it's come buzzwords, but we, we could show you it basically when one node disappears, gets blown up, takes them away, um, it, it basically self forms and protects itself. So there's there's multiple levels uh, that have been built into that by tested by Air Force and Army uh, in various uh, labs over the last uh, six to nine months. Got it, cool, thank you. Um, I think, I think the, the last
last question maybe is sort of just about traction in the, in the civilian and commercial world. Um, have, have you been able to get any sort of, um, are you, are you boot bootstrapping or able to sell? Are, are you going after venture investment? What's your pathway in the commercial world in parallel with this? Yeah, so currently the way we've been doing it is uh, we have about a third of our revenue uh, is made uh, on the commercial side. And uh, um, we, we do work with Emerson. Uh, and so we've actually got Amazon just used this for a study for noise. Um, so we, we have the noise detection. This was actually a noise detection sensor built in. Uh, and so the Air Force used it for basically hearing loss on a base. Amazon used the same thing in their own facilities. Uh, that was a project base. So we have some project revenue. Uh, we expect to try to go for the Strat 5 funding, which was the AFWorks event uh, this past year. Uh, because if we get the second Cibber 2 to miniaturize this device into the um, that's going to be really important for defense in general, but also there's lots of use cases in oil and gas. It, so utility facilities, when you walk into a metal facility, even the tactical radios today don't work. Uh, 5G is not going to work. So as a good example, uh, for, uh, we have NDAs with Cisco, uh, with, um, uh, with, I can drop a 5G radio in this box. And so I have 20 boxes that are ultra secure that that 5G won't be part of and the 21 box that's outside of the ultra secure environment will pop over backhaul over dirty 5G or secure 5G. And so uh, the commercial viability of that for critical infrastructures, uh, any ut energy utility, oil and gas workers who have hard connectivity today, 5G is not going to solve world hunger and it's also very interceptable and hackable uh, when you ask the experts. When you talked about the market, they're saying it's not. But the experts know that's still a, a risky uh, backhaul infrastructure. Got it. Great. Well, well JD, thank, thanks for thanks for the time. Great presentation. Thanks for filling the Q and A. Thank you all, and everybody. Stay safe and healthy.